Hello and welcome to this video in which I explain piecewise linear growth curve models. My name is Christian Geiser, I'm an instructor and statistical consultant with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials related to multivariate statistical analysis, including structural equation modeling, factor analysis, latent class analysis and multi-level analysis. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and to check out the description for additional free resources, including a link to my free weekly statistics newsletter, as well as uh, to free courses that I offer through Quantfish. In this video, I want to introduce you to piecewise linear growth models. And so let's take a look at a design that we could have a longitudinal design in which a piecewise growth curve model might be useful. In this example, I'm assuming that we have a single measured variable that was measured repeatedly on six different time points, for example, in a hypothetical study on anxiety in individuals, we may have administered the same anxiety questionnaire on six different measurement occasions. And moreover, there may have been an intervention or event that took place in the middle of the study, so between time point three and time point four, for example, it could be the case that at this point, the individuals received psychotherapy or um, an anxiety medication or some other kind of treatment to study the um, trajectory of anxiety, so the in reaction to a specific intervention or treatment. And then, so in this case, we wouldn't assume that there is the same, for example, linear trajectory that uh, applies to all six measurement occasions, but instead we would expect there to be a change after time point three in the trajectories if individuals respond to that treatment. So for example, anxiety may decline after the third time point, whereas it may have been stable for most individuals in the first during the period for the first three time points. So we want to model a different trajectory for the pre-intervention period as compared to the post-intervention period. And so this could not be accomplished by having just a single linear slope factor in the model. Instead, as we will see, we'll have different slope factors that allow us to model different components of this trajectory, the pre-treatment piece and the post-treatment piece of that tra overall trajectory. So what does the growth model then look like to model the, those two pieces? First of all, as in most standard growth curve models, we have an intercept factor, a random intercept that um, influences all measurement occasions with the same loading of 1.0. So this is our initial anxiety factor, so say that reflects true differences in anxiety at the onset of the study, meaning at time one. So that's the same as what you would have in a standard linear growth curve model, for example. And then next is the first linear slope factor that allows us to model the trajectory from time one to time three. So if there were any changes between time one and time three, any kind of linear changes over time, then this factor reflects those. So you can see this is a standard linear slope factor that has a loading of zero for time point one because no change has taken place yet and then has a loading of one for time point two and a fixed loading of two for time point three. So this factor, so that this factor will reflect linear changes between time one and time three. This factor has the same loading of two for the other time points, because the assumption is that for the remaining three time points, we need a different slope factor that could model the differences in the trajectories relative to the first time period. So we might see a different slope for the trajectories due to the intervention for time points one, four, five, and six. And so therefore we're holding this loading here constant at two for the remaining time points. And then we have furthermore a second slope factor that allows us to model the trajectory that may have changed 
for the last three time points. And so this is again a linear slope factor. And this kicks in after time point three. So you can see that this slope factor has no loadings on the first three measurement occasions here because that factor serves to model the specific trajectory post the intervention, so post the blue bar here. And so this is then a factor that has the a loading of one for time point four, loading of two for time point five, and a loading of three for time point six. I should mention as well that here the assumption is that the spacing between the time points is always the same, meaning there's always the same distance between neighboring measurement occasions, for example, always a week or so in between, so that we have equal spacing of measurement occasions. Otherwise, if we didn't have equal spacing here, then we would have to take that into account um, by fixing the loadings differently rather than fixing them in this um, linearly increasing manner for equally spaced time points. The three factors can all be correlated, so there can be associations between the intercept factor and the linear slope factors. So for example, individuals who have higher anxiety scores, they might show steeper declines in their anxiety scores over time. There could be a relationship. And then also there could be a re relationship between the change that takes place in the first period and the change that takes place in the second period. So that could also, they can also be correlated. And then finally, we have measurement error variables, epsilon, that reflect random measurement error and time-specific variance that is not accounted for by the intercept and slope factors. In this model, we would estimate then um, the covariances between the factors, but also their variances and means. So each of the latent factors has a variance and a mean to estimate so that we can look at um, inter-individual differences in the anxiety scores as well as inter-individual differences in the trajectories across time and the mean scores of these factors uh, tell us about the average level of anxiety at the onset for the intercept factor as well as the average rate of change for the linear one and linear two slope factors. So in summary this model is really useful when you have more time points and somewhere in the middle you have an event taking place or an intervention taking place to where you think that the trajectories might at some point take a different turn. They might become steeper for example or less steep over time then so that you can model those different pieces of the trajectory by including multiple growth curve factors that allow you to model different slopes. What you can also do with a model like this is you can have covariates, so you can estimate this as a conditional piecewise latent growth curve model where you have, for example, an intervention versus control group setting. Let's say you have a study where some of the individuals receive a placebo treatment after time three and other individuals receive an actual treatment, like for example, actual anxiety medication, then you could study the effect of that grouping variable on the intercept factor on the linear slope factor one and the linear slope factor two. The beta coefficients here are linear regression coefficients and those tell us about group differences on the intercept as well as the two slope factors here. In this case, we would not expect there to be any differences um, on the intercept factor if this was a randomized controlled study. So if you had randomly assigned individuals to a placebo in a treatment condition prior to the study, then we wouldn't expect them to change in their average anxiety scores at the onset. So the beta one intercept coefficient should not be um, substantial. And then also we would not expect any differences on the linear one slope factor because this models, this linear one slope factor models the trajectories prior to any intervention or treatment. And so prior to an intervention or treatment, there shouldn't be any differences between the groups in the slopes. So also for the beta one linear coefficient, we would expect this to be close to zero and not significant, but we would expect the beta one linear two coefficient 
to be different from zero if we're expecting a treatment effect because this coefficient would tell us whether the slopes differ post-treatment between the placebo and the treatment condition. So in that way, we could examine a treatment effect by looking at this beta 1 lin 2 coefficient that that um, reflects differences in the steepness of the slopes post-treatment, so for period two. And so there we would expect that um, individuals who respond to the treatment would then show a decline in their anxiety scores, for example, or a stronger decline than the individuals in the placebo condition. So in this way, a piecewise growth curve model can also be used to study treatment effects by making it a conditional model, adding covariates. You could also, in a quasi-experimental design, use a model like this, and you could add additional control variables, so covariates that um, might play a role here that allow you to control for pre-existing differences if you can't use random assignment to groups for some reason if this is more quasi-experimental you could also use a model like this to study um, intervention effects or the effects of some sort of event or treatment i hope you found this video useful to learn about piecewise latent growth curve models if you did, then please hit the like button. Also, don't forget to check out the description for additional resources, including my QuantFish course on latent growth curve models. And leave a comment in the comment section if you like, and I'll see you next time.